Attention. It's time to register for Elusian Live 2024, April 7th through 10th in San Antonio, Texas. Illuminate, innovate, inspire, explore higher education's greatest opportunities with future ready ideas, solutions, and best practices designed to drive transformation. Register now at elive.elusian.com. This conference is going to be epic. By now, you've heard me talk about Insights EDU in Phoenix, Arizona, February 20 through 22nd. Here's why I think you should join us at the Insights EDU conference. It's one of the few conferences focused on helping schools serve today's online and non-traditional students. If you're concerned at all about where your enrollments are going to come from in 2024 and beyond, and you should be concerned, you need to be at this conference. Register now at insightsedu.com and use promo code EDUP to save $50. Prepare to be astonished. Welcome everyone to the EDUP Experience podcast where we make education your business. I am Dr. Michelle Cantu Wilson and I'm filling in today for the world famous WWE champion, chess guru, and renowned opera singer, Dr. Joe Salustio. Yes, I'm joking. Joe is a mere public servant at a university in higher education, and he is one of the founders of the Ed Up Experience podcast. He's a dear friend. I told him I was going to joke on him because when I come on as a guest co-host, he always blares the air horn and has dubbed me La Reina del Air Horn. Um, and so I had to get him back. So I'm thrilled to join you today. And I am a higher education leadership consultant. I am also a community college trustee in Southeast Texas. And I have a wonderful guest co-host today. And um, Cole Clark is the managing director of Deloitte. And I'm going to let him introduce himself before I get to our amazing, our amazing guest today. Well, I have to narrow it down a bit. Deloitte's a really big firm, and my focus is higher education. So I serve as a managing director in our broader government and public sector uh, uh, portion of the firm that that focuses on on uh, higher education in the in the U.S. and have been doing that for about eight years. But I have spent my entire career in higher education, mostly with technology firms, but not as a technocrat, more of a, a industry evangelist with, uh, with te technology firms that have a particular uh, focus and relevance to uh, higher education's desire to transform. Uh, started with Apple Computer in the uh, 80s and early 90s when they were uh, beginning to get their sea legs under them and certainly had a, a considerable focus on uh, education. Uh, then moved to Sun Microsystems, which also had a very special and unique relationship with, with education and research, uh, and then into Oracle Corporation when Sun was acquired by Oracle in 2010, oh. and for a time led their global uh, industry team focused on education and nonprofit research. Excellent. Uh, my cousin worked for Oracle, and uh, when you said that you were an industry evangelist, I just want to make sure that there is dancing uh, in the industry. Okay. That's the only way that I'll accept it. It is an honor to have you as a co-host. I know that you have a connection with our guest and I'll leave it to y'all to uh, share that with our audience, but I'm going to go ahead and bring our guest in now. He is an amazing higher education yes. leader. I looked him up. I did my research and all of my cyber stalking and all I found were futuristic, observations, I found service that kind of goes above and beyond what <laughs> other leaders are doing in higher education. And I also found a lot of promise uh, of leadership. And so I'm thrilled to bring Jonathan Coppell, the president of Montclair University. Jonathan, welcome to the show. We are so excited to have you. Thank you. Uh, I'm excited to be here. Uh... First of all, as you said, with a friend, uh, Cole, but also to get to meet you, Michelle. And uh, I know you have an extensive background in higher education, but I didn't know uh, you were La Reina de Airhorn. Uh, so <laughs> it's a pleasure to be with you, Your Majesty. 
Thank you. <laughs> well, it's nice to, to meet with the common folk. It's it's really a pleasure. <laughs> I do take time when I when I have it. Um, no, welcome. It's really exciting. I did cyberstalk you, and I was blown away. I'm going to bring a bunch of things up that I want to make sure that we cover today, but I want to give you an opportunity to just kick it off. Um, Jonathan, who are you, and why do you do what you do? Yeah, that's a great place to start because uh, I'm. I'm always excited to talk about not just Montclair State University, but uh, a big portion of the higher education world that I don't think gets talked about enough. Uh, you know, there's a lot of conversations about higher education these days, more than ever, and they're focused on a small number of institutions uh, mm. and uh, that really serve a tiny percentage of the American population and really are incredibly unrepresentative of what higher education is about. Nothing wrong, nothing wrong with those institutions. I'm not talking about the current controversies, but mm -hmm. but but you would think that the world looked a lot like Harvard and Penn and Columbia and that the, and that their experiences spoke to the broader experiences of the average American uh, university student. Uh, and if you did think that You'd be completely wrong, right? <laughs> so, right. Um, and so, and so, this is an opportunity to talk about Montclair State University, uh, the second largest university in New Jersey, uh, twenty-three thousand students, uh, and a university that represents the great diversity of this country. So, we're a majority minority mm -hmm. uh, institution, uh, what's called a Hispanic serving institution. Uh, in fact, more than forty percent of our students are. Uh, uh, Hispanic. Uh, almost half of our students are the first in their family to go to college. Um, and well over 40% uh, of our students are Pell eligible, which means they come from uh, families with incomes less than $60,000 a year. All of that's really important because we'll get to talk about this. Uh, a lot of the conversation about what's wrong with higher education, which has some validity to it, by the way, uh, hmm. I'm a little bit different than some of my colleagues in, in acknowledging that. But this idea that higher education is no longer a, a ladder that people can use to change their life circumstances, that it's no longer an engine of mm -hmm. economic and social mobility, uh, that it no longer delivers on the promise of the American dream, that's all bunk. That's just all bunk. Uh, and, I agree. And the and the families that uh, that make a commitment to come to Montclair and the students who who work hard every day to a, a extract every bit of value out of the, that they can from this magnificent university, mm -hmm. they because they believe in the promise of education. Exactly. And then our job is to show uh, which we do, and I I will talk I'm sure in conversation about my previous institution, Arizona State University, uh, and many others to show that. The idea that you can't be both an excellent university and accessible to large numbers of people, that that's also bunk. Mm -hmm. that, that there are amazing schools, uh, amazing universities doing remarkable things, providing incredible learning opportunities for students. And, and unlike some of those uh, more famous institutions, we don't tell you the first thing uh the first thing when we meet you how many people we reject when they apply to our university <laughs> uh, we want to tell you how big a difference attending uh montclair can make in your life and we have the data to to back that up and and i'm excited i'm excited to spread that message because i think that a lot of the a lot of the negativity uh a lot of the skepticism regarding higher education as i say some of it has merit. I will get. I'll, I'm always happy to acknowledge that. But a lot of it's because the story is so badly told. So I appreciate the opportunity, uh, the, the opportunity to be on this podcast and to talk with your listeners. Well, we have a global audience, and so this is the ideal place. I told Joe this is the hub for the world when it comes to higher education. Now, you and um, Cole are actually connected through an organization. Cole, I was wanting you to talk about this and then ask, of course, the next question on your mind. But you're connected to a forward thinking group of leaders and an organization that is, um, I guess, seeking out the future of education and making pathways to it for higher education. So, Cole, can you talk about that connection and then um, ask a burning yeah. question in your mind in regards to your good friend, Jonathan? So I think the, the genesis for 
developing the forum for higher ed's new era or new era forum as we call it for short was really to get at exactly what jonathan's been talking about which is that there is there's innovation and there's uh uh you know um, excellence uh in in outcomes for students across the country but because higher ed's not monolithic and because uh, some of the national brand names uh, tend to suck up all the all the oxygen. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a need to uh, come together and talk about some of this innovation that goes on uh, and as a way to more speak with more with one voice. Um, and so for the last couple of years, Jonathan's joined us and we've tried to uh, hone in on four or five of the most salient, important issues and opportunities facing the facing the sector, you know, as you were talking, Jonathan, one of the things that I thought about was, um, you know, it, you, you can only control so much of, of the narrative, um, mm -hmm. but what are some of the things that you try to keep on message about uh, when, when touting some of those or busting some of those myths that you, you were just articulating and not get distracted by uh, uh, other things that, that, that might might not be additive to that uh, to to that aim. Well, I think probably the probably I'll I'll just I think we should just get at some of the things that are the most um, common uh, critiques of higher education. Uh, one of them uh, one of them is this debt question um, that uh, students graduate from college with an unmanageable amount of debt. Uh, and 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 look, I don't want. I don't want to minimize that as an issue at all. It, it's a huge issue. Um, it's complicated uh, because it's impossible. It's impossible to have a, a, a really robust conversation about that without talking a little bit about how the funding of higher education has changed mm -hmm. over the last 30 years, particularly public higher education, uh, where it used to be possible uh, for a person to attend college, literally, if you talk to people of a certain age, they paid a few hundred dollars a semester because public universities were supported by, uh, by the taxpayer. Right. And we sort of stopped doing that as a society. And so the burden shifted to the students. And so, uh, obviously it's harder to, it's harder to get a good return on investment as the investment gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Mm -hmm. But, but, Putting aside that complexity, the part that I think people uh, lose sight of is that if you actually earn a degree, you probably are going to be just fine. Uh, you probably are going to be just fine. Uh, and that, in fact, uh, the, the payoff on a, on a college degree is still uh, economically uh, very robust. A million dollars a year in career earnings, people reduce it to that. There's reasons why that's overly simplistic and flawed and so on and so forth, but it gives you some sense. And mm -hmm. more than 40% of the outstanding debt that gets talked about all the time, that's people who didn't earn a degree, right? Now, that's, yeah. a, that's a huge issue. I'll come back to that in a second, but it's different than saying that the degree doesn't pay, mm -hmm. right? And so, so we have to have, we have, to have a really uh, more nuanced conversation about that. And so one of the things that I like to talk about is first of all, the the return on investment for our Montclair grads. And the Wall Street Journal uh, recently said, we're one of the top public universities in the country and, and uh, number four in our state, only behind Princeton and a couple of engineering schools. Um, mm -hmm. Because for the average Montclair grad, the benefit from a salary point of view and the, and the cost left over it only takes about a year and a half, given the advantage, to pay for the cost. That's mm. a pretty good. That's a pretty good investment, right? Yeah, I'd agree. Pretty good. Like I think most people would feel pretty good about would feel pretty good about that. You know, sure, people from Princeton they don't have a lot of debt because Princeton has a lot of money, so <laughs> they don't have <laughs> they don't have that they don't have that problem. So the reason why that matters is because then uh, it's really important for us as institutions to make sure we're doing everything in our power to get students across the finish line. Mm -hmm. um, and we're really, we're really proud uh, at Montclair uh, of, the, of the success of our students and the completion rates. We want them to get, we want them to get better. 
Mm -hmm. uh, there's no doubt about it. And we're laser focused on, and, and we'll get into this uh, in the conversation, laser focused on establishing exactly what are the obstacles that, mm -hmm. that bump people uh, up, uh, uh, you know, from the from degree completion. But that's that's really critical. And one of the things that's the most important question that I think prospective college students and their families should be asking when they look at universities is exactly this. What is the completion rate? Who who graduates and who doesn't? And and I think I think people are getting more sophisticated about that. It's mm -hmm. one of the reasons why, even though if you read the headlines, everybody's like gnashing their teeth and wringing their hands and saying, oh my God, nobody's going to college anymore. Yeah, we've had record enrollments for the past three years um, because people are becoming more discerning about this. And I think that's I think that's great. Um, yeah. And and we're particularly proud that the the usual metric, which you can tell kind of what the likelihood of graduation is by by what is the background of a student economically, by the way, not how they did in school. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to predict whether somebody's going to graduate, don't look at their grades, right. look at their family income. Mm -hmm. which is a sad statement, but true. Um, so we're really proud that our students graduate at a rate that's 15 percentage points higher than the statistics would would lead you to predict. That's mm -hmm. that's top 10 in the country. And I think people are paying attention to that. Um, and they should. Yeah. And we should be judged. But, you know, this is, this is where it gets to, like, the critique is real. We should be judged on how well we're doing. Absolutely. We absolutely should be judged. And and it's interesting because you've you've covered a lot of kind of what the the pushback has been, but we know that a lot of that, Jonathan, is just sensationalism, right? We know that that is clickbait. We know that that is for ratings and for numbers and for views. We understand that. Now, I agree with you on the things that we should be held accountable for. But what I think is interesting is that there are efforts being made in higher education to be more forward facing to the public, um, to enroll the entire family as community colleges do. Mm -hmm. um, and then also to provide data dashboards that make completion rates clear, that make time to degree clear, that make parts of term and the demographics of students. And so it's funny that there are these two completely separate conversations happening, but we know that that's orchestrated. Um, and so that can be frustrating, but I think what I like that you do is you have a very buoyant uh, sense about you in the way that you uh, celebrate students. I was watching your videos, um, your welcome to students, your positivity and your attitude. Uh, and I think that sometimes that is underappreciated in higher education and our bureaucracy and our seriousness and our academics. And, yeah. um, and so... One of the things that you said in a quote that I saw was public universities play a fundamental role in advancing society. And that is such promise. Um, and so talk about some of the things that you have done as an educator, perhaps even at ASU uh, and certainly at Montclair to provide that promise to students and to keep that hope alive. Yeah. So let's come back to the where you started at some point, because I actually I actually think that uh, it's part of the job to be energetic and fun and and just be a human, right? Yeah. Like we're not we're not cardboard cutouts. Mm -hmm. You know, we should be we should be accessible and real, and that's part of mm -hmm. I think being an effective campus leader. But let's put that aside for a second because what you're hit on in the, in the second part is sort of something I'm really passionate about, which mm -hmm. is it's not it. We are public institutions. People say, oh, you're public institutions because you get some of your budget from the from the state. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, that's true. And and don't get me wrong, even though the numbers gone down over the last 30, 50 years, still significant part of our budget, much sure. less than people think, uh, less than 25 percent. Um, but but that's not what makes us public, from my point of view. Um, what makes us public is that our mission is to serve the public interest. Uh, yeah. And part of the way, this is it, part of the way we serve the public interest is by doing exactly what we've already been talking about, by mm -hmm. creating educational opportunities that are uh, that are transformative um, for the individual, but also transformative for society. And one of the conversations we had at the gathering that Cole convened uh, in Dallas earlier, uh, 
well, I guess it wasn't this year, but at the end of last year, uh, I, I felt very strongly had to be articulated was that education is a public good. Um, and what I mean by that is society is richer because more people are educated. And the, the growth of the American economy post-World War II is directly linked to the GI Bill, which made it possible for a whole bunch of people to go to college who otherwise mm -hmm. wouldn't have gone to college. And that was one of the pieces of fuel that led to this dramatic expansion of the American economy. So it's not just about return to the individual, it's return to the society. But I think universities have the opportunity to be much more than places where people get degrees. These are communities of thousands of people, students, faculty, and staff. And if we harness that energy um, and intelligence and creativity and directed it uh, at the most challenging problems we face as a society, we now have an incredible instrument for good. Uh, mm -hmm. And so part of what excites me about being in higher education and about having uh, having a role like this and the role that I, I had at ASU where I was dean of what's called the Watts College of uh, Public Service and Community Sol Solutions, mm -hmm. it's to sort of redesign the university to be an engine of social innovation and and problem solving. Mm -hmm. and to and to work with communities as a partner not like this conquering force that has all the answers but as a partner and say hey um what are your biggest challenges uh and what are your aspirations mm -hmm. and how do we take advantage of the fact that we have a business school that's supporting entrepreneurship and a and an education college that's training teachers mm -hmm. and uh right and i could go on i could identify every part of the university and how do we take what we do well and make that an asset that the community can deploy to address mm -hmm. its challenges and then along the way here's the beautiful part and then along the way our students get hands-on learning opportunities by being involved in these things so it's not just something in the classroom they're out there they're rolling up their sleeves. They're working. Uh, they're working with folks in the trenches, addressing the biggest challenges. And our faculty can do research, understanding what works, what doesn't, what are mm -hmm. the dynamics at play. And so you have this this virtuous engine where the education, the research, and the community progress are all propelling each other. Man, when you get that working well, I'll tell you, it's a beautiful thing. And uh, I'm excited. And maybe we can talk about some of the things we're doing uh, in the communities around uh, mm -hmm. Montclair, uh, Patterson, New Jersey, very interesting historic uh, city that played a critical role in our country. Newark, uh, which is the, <laughs> the biggest city in New Jersey, a few miles away where we're supporting uh, the school system in, in interesting ways. We're showing that a university that is torqued to address these biggest challenges can make a huge, huge difference. And, and I'm, I'm proud of some of the ways we did that in Arizona as well. And, and I wanna be clear, and a lot of universities are doing this kind of, this kind of work and that story needs to be told uh, precisely to your point so we don't get distracted by some of these negative narratives that, that focus on, on shortcomings without appreciating the, the, whole, the whole picture. But I think in order, sorry. I think in, in order to uh, actually deliver on that, uh, Jonathan, wouldn't you agree that, that the, the academic enterprise has to be nimble enough to adapt to the changing needs that the community has, the labor market uh, for skills? Um, and um, a lot of places do struggle with being able to not only create the new, but tear down the old in order to make space for um, what the institution needs to do next. How have you, how have you been able to navigate that at, at your institution? Well, so I definitely think you're right. I mean, universities uh, are not known for being uh, nimble for the most part. And, and partially that's because we are legacy institutions in some ways. We hire faculty, we hire and and they have a long, they have a long, uh, they have a long tenure, sometimes literally. Mm -hmm. Um, and and so there can be some challenges in adapting. I think that the key is building um is building a mindset, right? That nice. that our purpose 
Our purpose is to serve the needs of the community. That's what we exist for. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, to, and to basically, and this is, I think, what makes Montclair different, even different than other institutions that do work in the community, that you have to lay out the challenging, uh, the challenging uh, sort of goal that says, if the community is not better because of what we're doing, then we have not achieved our mission, right? It, 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 it has to be that. It can't be the, you know, sort of, uh, so I, 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 I will, you'll have to forgive me. I have nerd speak problems and I, I do. It. But, <laughs> you are, you are in good company. Go but for it. But it can't be, it can't be a positive externality. That is to say, oh, like we did a good thing. Like, isn't that nice? Yay. Good for us. It has to be like, no, no, that's not the, 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 the phrase is like, it's not extra credit. Mm-hmm. That's the assignment. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think when you when you articulate it that way, uh, it 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 sort of creates a different a different imperative. Now, I will say Montclair is the right play to do, place to do this work precisely because our origin was always about public service. We started like a lot of like a lot of universities as a, a normal school, which is a weird way of saying we train teachers. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, by the way, ASU was Tempe normal school. So that's, this is, this is not an, an uncommon origin story and gradually the mission grew. And so, by the way, we still embrace that mission and we still are innovating in, in ways to create, uh, to create better teachers, to, to diversify the pipeline, to feed the pipeline, uh, as a national crisis and getting, mm-hmm. uh, great K-12 teachers into the classroom. And we, we still, we still embrace that as core to our mission. But we started with that baseline, right? That that we existed to serve the public, and I think, I think our faculty, our staff, they are drawn. They are drawn to that mission, and they and they want to be of. They want to be of value. They want to be of use. And and you you just need to keep reminding people that this is what it's about. I will say, I think the hardest thing. Uh, and I've 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 had to learn this myself. I think we all have to learn it. Is is how to be a good partner uh, when you're working in the community. It it's not about coming in and saying this is what we're going to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's about coming in. It's about introducing yourself. It's about talking a little bit about what you're what you believe you're capable of. But ultimately, it's about listening. Mm-hmm. It starts with listening. Um, and establishing trust. And so I'm an impatient guy. I like to do things. I like to get results quickly. But I heard this phrase a few years ago, uh, which which I really it did it did click into it got through my thick skull. Uh, you got to move at the speed of trust. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, and sometimes that's a little slower than you might like. But but frankly, yeah, absolutely. Uh, if you don't if you don't have trust, um, it's pretty hard to do anything effectively. And and there are lots of reasons why people in in the communities we serve, particularly communities of color and other marginalized communities, there's lots of reasons why there's distrust of universities over the years, and yeah. so we have to uh, we have to overcome that. And uh, and when you do, though, uh, you can really do you can do great work together. Are you kidding me? No, I'm not. For a third straight year, the Edup Experience will be recording live at Elysium Live 2024. This year in San Antonio, Texas, April 7th through the 10th, illuminate, innovate, and inspire. That's the framework for the conference. Leaders from institutions around the world will converge at Lucian Live 2024 to discover game-changing technology, share industry insights, and build powerful connections. It's time to explore higher education's greatest opportunities with future-ready ideas, solutions, and best practices designed to drive transformation. You can register now at elive.elucian.com. Epic. Oh, yeah. You've heard me talk about the Insights EDU conference. Well, let me tell you three reasons why I think everyone listening should join us in Phoenix, Arizona on February 20 through 22nd for Insights EDU. One, it's one of the few conferences focused on helping schools serve today's online and non-traditional students. Two, you can expect a mix of speakers you won't hear anywhere else, including higher ed leaders from Google, LinkedIn, Adobe, and more. And reason three, Insights EDU has an agenda packed with sessions discussing the latest trends in higher ed leadership, marketing, and enrollment management. 
Register now at insightsedu.com and use promo code EDUP to save $50 off your registration. Oh, yeah. You can, and I think it's interesting that you ended with that point just because as a Latina, man, the first in my family to go to college and the first of 26 grandkids to even think about it. Um, yeah, I never thought um, of universities as engines of public good. Um, that's just not your experience, but it sounds like you're saying the mindset needs to change, right? Um, you're saying if you come in and you assume that you're the big guy on campus, right, or you're the big kid on the playground, you're going to be taught that culture eats strategy for lunch. Right. Um, their communities have expectations. Communities have norms. Uh, communities have they have ebbs and flows, and so. Um, one of the things that I really appreciate is learning about the merger that happened um, with your university and a college of education, if that's not correct, uh, then correct me. Um, and you mentioned this briefly, the teacher shortage. It is a national crisis. It's one near and dear to my heart. I was an alternatively certified public education teacher. I was also an assistant principal for six years. Um, and now I do work as a consultant in helping colleges of education in that space. Um, what was that like? Because I looked at the history of mergers. And I don't see a lot of them that have been happening um, in the recent future quite the way that uh, yours was done or even at all. So, so talk to us a little bit about so, that. Joe so was different, really excited different about things, that. Two different things there. You're, you're kind of like Ghostbusters. You're kind of crossing the streams a little bit. Um, <laughs> So I want to deal with both of them. Okay. Um, so, so let's let's put let's save um, teacher education because it's like that's super super important to me, um, <laughs> and uh, we can't we can't thrive as an educational student if we're not working with our partners in the K twelve educational space. Uh, exactly. And and I think we've done some really interesting stuff there, and I want to talk about that. Good. 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 Okay, but the merger, uh, that's talking about something called Bloomfield College. There uh, you go, Bloomfield College, very Bloomfield, good. Bloomfield College is a unique institution in New Jersey. We don't have any HBCUs. They've gotten a lot of attention nationally, uh, very important institutions, historically black colleges and universities. There are none of those in New Jersey. Um, mm -hmm. And what Bloomfield is what's called a predominantly black institution, uh, which means that its student body is largely African-American, uh, and it happens to also be a Hispanic-serving institution like Montclair. Um, wow. And it is the only four-year predominantly Black institution in New Jersey. So it plays a, it plays a distinctive role. Um, like a lot of small colleges, actually like a lot of small minority-serving colleges, Bloomfield was in danger of closing uh, about two years ago. And it won't surprise you, given even what you've heard me say uh, just in the beginning of this discussion, that when when confronted with the idea that the only black serving institution in New Jersey, which is about six six or so <laughs> miles from Montclair, was going to close, that I was like, we can't we can't say all this stuff and not do something about that. And so, and when did this happen? When did this about start? Two, two years ago. But uh, you started two years ago. That yeah, was, it was my first was... six. This is right. This was within <laughs> my first few months as president. So yeah. Wow. So, so I was just like, well, we can't, we can't do that. We, we can't just stand here and watch that and say, you know, oh, that's a shame. <laughs> um, and so we, we first figured out a way to, in some sense, for lack of a more nuanced way to put it, extend a line of credit to make sure that hmm. they wouldn't be closed simply because their ratings and their, you know, their paper status forced them to close. And then over the last uh, two years, we've been working, uh, to merge Bloomfield into, into Montclair State University. And uh, as you know, but not necessarily every, and Cole knows, but not necessarily everybody listening, probably on a more or less one a week, maybe one every two weeks, institutions close. If you read the Chronicle or Inside Higher Ed, there's just, uh, they close. And as I say, they're mostly, they're mostly minority serving, um, religious or rural institutions. They just, mm -hmm. and by the way, you know, that's capitalism. That's creative destruction. Not every institution should last. That's okay. Like in some cases, that's okay. I'm not advocating that never, never should a college close. But, mm -hmm. and here's the but, but 
um, I think it's important that there are differentiated pathways available to different communities. And here's where this ties in to exactly where you where you started, Michelle, about the distinctiveness of of your the community you came from. Um, I think one of the things that we've appreciated about HBCUs over the last few years is how they create a learning environment where African American students, uh, in many cases, have thrived. Uh, mm -hmm. Precisely because it's an environment that has been designed uh, around the needs and strengths, by the way, that doesn't often get stated clear enough, mm -hmm. of a particular community mm -hmm. and leverage those strengths, those distinctive characteristics to create better outcomes. And so what we're excited about is to say, how do we maintain that, the differentiated learning environment of Bloomfield? Um, but create something better than before by virtue mm -hmm. of its integration into a robust, comprehensive public research university, Montclair State University, which by the way, I wanna be clear, like we have, we're have we 15% African-American, our students have terrific outcomes. We're not saying that we needed to do this in order to address that. That's mm -hmm. a strength. The question mm -hmm. is how do we build something that works better for some learners? Um, right. And this is a huge question in higher ed because, because you're going to see lots of institutions uh, unable to sustain themselves individually. And as I say, that's okay. Some of them should close. But if you lose the variation, if mm -hmm. you lose the diversity of opportunities because only one model, the large public model, exists as an alternative to the, to the rich elite you know, uh, universities that we talked about already, well, yeah. then that's going to leave a lot of people out. Right. Um, and so we're, we're excited about this project. It's not, it's, I will tell you, it's not an easy thing. This is a, a public university trying to take a private university and put it together. It's, it's difficult from an economic point of view, from a regulatory point of view, from an NCAA point. I mean, you name it. Um, mm -hmm. And so we're working through that uh, we're working through that right now, but excited. And I think it's going to be an important, um, it's going to be an important case mm -hmm. uh, for the future of the sector, because there's going to be, there's going to be more of this kind of adjustment. Jonathan, do you think that um, the job, um, because of the, the, the changes that are, you know, that are upon us, uh, things like having to potentially confront mergers and consolidations, the, the pressure to leverage technology in ways that higher ed's never had to in the past, uh, the threats uh, that some of that technology potentially uh, portends, um, the, uh, I would argue, significant increase in the number of stakeholders to whom the president is accountable, the board, the community, the parents, the students, the faculty, um, has the job changed, and do you think that uh, that uh, the skills and competencies and experiences that you know you acquired over your uh, career prepared you for the role? Are there uh, and is the job itself uh, in need of a sort of a reset in terms of what the progression, what the tr traditional path mm -hmm. to pathway to the presidency uh, has been, and 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 maybe what it should be going forward? Hmm. Great. Uh, it's a great question. There's a lot of different great things thing. in there. So let me sort of follow your thread. So, and I've, I, it's, it's been on my mind in part because I've been at a, a few gatherings of uh, college and university presidents just in the last, uh, just in the last week or so. Um, and so I wasn't a president uh, 20 or 30 years ago, but I've been with some of those too. And they all said that this is way hard. <laughs> way harder so to your point they, they 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 see exactly what you described cole uh just the degree of difficulty uh, has gotten quite high um and i Wait, think that jonathan are you saying that people who were presidents 20 30 years ago are acknowledging that today's presidency is far more complex than what they experienced yeah that's exactly right Wow. Um, oh. They watch. I see it, but that's also shocking. No, they watch. They watch. Uh, they watch what's going on uh, now, and they say, I, "You have to deal with stuff that we didn't have to deal with." Um, mm -hmm. And part part of that is the there's a lot of different pieces of that. 
uh, part of that, you know, we're seeing in real time is the the scrutiny with respect to uh, campus engagement on current political issues. And it's not just Israel Gaza, although sure. that's that's obviously very much of the moment. And that's been an interesting uh, dynamic here at Montclair <laughs> for, for particular reasons. Um, but there's a host of there's a host of ways in which universities are under enormous scrutiny um and they've become they've become crucibles uh mm -hmm. where many of the large political and cultural battles of society right. uh have have become uh located and uh and a and a, and a, a lightning rod uh right. for various for various parties by the way i'm not not just the right left the left sure. as well and in and in particular particular geographies uh the president if you're a university leader in florida or texas or whatever this is a huge part of your job is navigating mm -hmm. navigating the politics of those issues on a on a daily basis so that's mm -hmm. that's very complicated the economics of higher education have become extremely uh mm -hmm. difficult as we already talked about you know public investment has gone down uh the costs have gone up uh, because uh, the main cost of a university is people. Mm -hmm. um, and so as you have inflation and so on and so forth, you get massive, massive stressors on the on the budget. And yet I don't have to explain to you that there's also pressure to not raise tuition. And so Always. Uh, the money has to come from somewhere. Right. So mm -hmm. figuring out how that's going to work. Cole alluded to um, uh, a part that is. A, a giant question mark, which is how is technology um, and other other changes going to alter the university? A big session uh, that that he put together was on artificial intelligence and mm -hmm. what that what that means for the university. And it's a it's a as I say, it's a big black box. We don't know the answer to that. And then the probably the last thing I would put on this list, not that it's the last thing, but I'm the last thing for yeah. now <laughs> is the expectations of what a university does. Now, now look, you're like, well, you just added to the expectations. You said you're going to solve all the world's problems, but I'm not even talking about that. <laughs> I'll give a really, I'll give a really, um, a really concrete example of what I mean by that. Um, so we have a, we have a mental health crisis in this country uh, and it's, it's affecting people of all ages, but it's particularly acute. Uh, for people under the age of 30. Um, right. And that includes our students. And and there was a time when people wouldn't have expected the university to do much about that. Um, yeah. That time is yeah. not now. And so, so, and by the way, it's interesting because people say, well, that's none of your business. Why are you hiring counselors and, and social workers? And, and, it, and the answer is because if our job is to ensure student success and one of the obstacles to student success is student mental health, then we have to address it because you're going to find us accountable for students not completing. And so that's a mm -hmm. huge issue now for every university is how are we addressing the mental health and, and well-being needs of our students? That's not something that really people expected from the university 30 years, 30 years ago. Like, no, it would have been the exact opposite mentality. You know, we know the, the bootstrap mentality that existed so long ago, but I think what you're speaking to is the idea that if you sit down with a student who says, I'm struggling, and they tell you why they're struggling, then it's not about numbers anymore. Uh, it's about the student and a byproduct of helping the student is, you know, you get to persist and you, that you retain them and they complete. Um, but it is hard as an educator and certainly probably as the top educator of an institution to say, we're not gonna address a national crisis people who are here right I, I admire you for being so vocal about that because I just don't students are telling us I've run focus groups uh, back when in my previous institution I ran focus groups for community college students who said I know that you have counselors but we need more signs we need to know more you have to go overboard because we're not looking up we're stressed out yeah. we're struggling you need to do more if students are telling us to do more Yep. We need to be 10 steps ahead. So thank yep. you. Thank yeah. you for talking about this. It's a, a, you can, and look, I would love to be able to, I mean, this is where the pressures really get at it, right? The financial mm -hmm. pressures, the, but, but you, you have to do more. And, and, 
And that's why I think people don't understand. They look at the university and they say, um, what are all these people? David Brooks had a piece like, oh, there's all these bureaucrats. It's, you know, the, the ratio of professor to non-professor. It's like, it's a little more nuanced than that. Um, sure. So, you know, so those, all those people working on the mental health of our students, um, yeah, they're not professors, uh, <laughs> but they are essential to us achieving our mission. And I'm not going to say that there aren't ways that universities can be more efficient and maybe there's bureaucratic in inefficiency. We run a pretty tight ship here. I will tell you that like our ratio of employees to students is, is the best in New Jersey and our cost per degree Good. is the best in New Jersey. But, Good. but the reality is universities are expected to perform a wide variety of functions uh, that they, that they didn't in the past. And I, I want to I want to get to the question that Cole raised, which is an interesting one, which is, do you do we have the right people in these jobs? Um, and one of the one of the most common, I'll just use that as an opportunity to address one of the most common digs, which is like, why do we have these people with PhDs who are researchers and academics? What does this have to do with being? an academic. Um, and I don't care whether they can write a research paper. I care whether they know how to run a university. Mm. It, it's not, it, it's not an off the wall no. statement. Um, sure. but, but, um, <laughs> the, we, these still are educational institutions and the primary, the primary set of folks that you need to bring with you as you do make the pivots. Go back to what Cole said. How do you get an organization to pivot? How do you how do you create nimbleness? Mm -hmm. The primary constituencies that you have to bring along with you are faculty, mm -hmm. people who care about teaching, people who care about ideas, people who care about research, people who think that that matters. And if you if you don't appreciate those things yourself, if you haven't lived that and done that work and, and felt it's important, your ability to communicate um, with those folks and to bring them along is going to be severely, uh, severely impacted. Um, mm -hmm. And it is interesting that we, we say to, um, we say, well, why can't you have, you know, Joe, business executive, run a university, and yet nobody's offering me to be CEO of Toshiba or whatever. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Or you know, most people would say, "Well, Jonathan, what do you know about finance? How can you be president of a bank?" It's like, "Well, I know leadership. I know organizations." I, so now, by the way, I'm an arrogant SOB, so I think I could run a bank. But well, but, hold on, but, I want to interrupt the you there. Is, on that but the point because... is, nobody would nobody would say that. No, and of course not. Nobody would say that. And and so I think that I think that having an appreciation for the distinctive culture um, and ethos of a university is important. Now, by the way, having a PhD after your name doesn't guarantee that you have that. Um, but <laughs> I know. <laughs> well, that's I found that in my experiences before. <laughs> it helps, it, but it increases the odds. Let me put it that sure. way. It increases the odds. And sure. so, and so I, I think that, um, I think that, I think that that's, uh, I think that's, um, that's necessary, but I, but I do think Cole, to your, to your point, um, it might, it, we, we probably could do a better job of, um, of preparing people. I, I'm like, I, I'm like, the, I'm like the geek king. So like when I was in college, I went over to the Graduate School of Education and took a course on university administration because I kind of had this idea that I might do something like this. And so my whole pathway, uh, my whole pathway as, uh, you know, since I went to graduate school, I was thinking about this, I was looking at it. So I was sort of preparing myself to do this. But a lot of people come in and and they nobody ever taught them how to read a budget. Um, Right. Nobody ever taught them how to think about marketing um, and personnel administration and so on and so forth. So I think there probably are ways in which we could better prepare people. And, and, and we're trying to do a better job of that ourselves, right? How do you work with department chairs and associate deans and deans? And, because it, it's about a pipeline. It's about a process. Um, and so I think that, that it's really interesting to raise that question in a, in a, in a, in a sort of sector-wide basis because the, part of the implication of having shorter tenures uh, is that more people are gonna be doing these jobs.
Yes. Right. Um, and I was looking at your background, uh, Jonathan, and I think that I'm going to take a liberty here and just say that you are uniquely positioned to, I guess, lead this conversation because everything in your vita tells me uh, that you know about the global issues. All I see is public administration and policy and politics and management and political science and public policy. And I mean, it is throughout your entire academic background. I mean, aside from wanting to know if you're ever going to run for president, um, <laughs> I guess, give me some specifics about what you think that our future leaders need to know, because one of the exciting things happening with the EdUp experience is I've created a spinoff called EdUp Emergence, um, and I'm going to be interviewing inter, uh, emergent leaders, department chairs, and deans, and vice presidents who have the presidency in their sites, or who, you know, could go in that way. So, what are, I mean, it's hard to make faculty nimble. I was faculty, you were faculty, we know. Um, it's hard to change, but looking at the future and based on, on Cole's question, what are some of those uh, skills that they need to master in order to be in a position that's gonna be maybe more challenging than yours? Yeah, so so by the way, I wanna say something. So so you're right, like you look at my, my, mm -hmm. my background and my interests and it all does kind of lead to this and that's, that's why I'm in this job because it almost combines all of my, my interests. I, mm -hmm. I say that because I'm so blown away by my colleagues who are like really effective, great university presidents, and it's like, oh yeah, there. I'm also a cell biologist or whatever. I'm like, <laughs> like, like, how is that? Like, how is that even possible? Like, there are people who have really different academic backgrounds, and yet they combine the skills together. I am, I, I, I really am. I'm, I'm often awed by those mm -hmm. by those kind of rare birds who have yeah. these uh, really different parts of the brain that they that <laughs> they activate for these different roles and it's amazing leadership and, is a whole passion though it's, yeah and they'll tell you they'll tell you it's related and no i what i do in the lab is is intimate related and of course i don't understand that because i you know all i would do is break stuff if i were in a lab but <laughs> but but i it, it really does it really does uh it really does impress me um look i think I think that uh, I think that the preparation the preparation for these jobs is this interesting it's this interesting combination of uh, substantive or what you might you might call mechanical skills the budgets the personnel's um, uh, understanding the the legal and the governance uh, structures of universities mm -hmm. um, and then and then if you're going to be successful though it's all the other stuff which people dismissively call soft skills. Um, that's, that's, where all, that's where all the action is. Um, your ability your ability to interact with very varied constituencies, right? So you're, you're dealing with students, you're dealing with faculty, you're dealing with staff, you're dealing with alumni, you're dealing with your board. If you're like I am at a public university, you're dealing with the state legislature, you're dealing with the mm -hmm. governor's office, um, you're dealing with other uh, other uh, political constituencies. You're dealing with the federal government. You're dealing with the state government. You're dealing with the many townships that you touch. Um, mm -hmm. So, and I I could go on. And it's it's you're trying to raise money uh, from people uh, and build relationships that way. So, mm -hmm. so a good portion of the success of this is about uh, your human uh, interaction skills, your ability to listen. Uh, people think of it's about people think of it as being about talking. It's obviously mm -hmm. about talking. It's also about listening. Um, and and so I don't know that I, I I think you can teach some of those things. But what you really need to do is give people an opportunity to practice those skills. Um, because mm, I don't I don't think there's a way I don't think there's a way to learn those things without um, without practicing. Let me use this as an opportunity to come back to something that I um that I alluded to you've got to be a human being mm -hmm. and you've got to, you've got to be able to have fun. So since you, since you did some sleuthing, you probably found silly pictures of me uh, in my, in my Dr. K DJ persona, but also just saw walking, some things. Yeah. Walking around and having fun with students and uh, enjoying yes. interacting with, with the, with the community. Mm -hmm. um, and you have to, you have to be able to do that. You have to like it. Um, and I do, I just like being at a campus. I like being, 
I like being around the enthusiasm of the students and their energy. It, it keeps me going. I love talking to faculty about research. Faculty are always surprised that I'm equally happy talking to an engineer or a poet or a physicist or a, a, mm -hmm. you know, a music instructor. I just find it all, I find it all exciting and interesting. And I think you need that. I don't know how you could, I personally, I don't know how you could do this um, without that. And I would say that's important on another level um, because uh, these days people are going to throw darts. Like you're going to get, you're going to mm -hmm. get angry uh, messages from inside the university, from outside the university. People sure. are going to question every decision you make. Uh, if you're not comfortable being who you are, it's going to be really hard. And I'm not saying that means like you think you're flawless. I, that's not what I mean at all. I mean, like just right. that you, that you own it. Like you own who you are, you own the decisions you make. Um, humanity. You, you accept your strengths and your weaknesses. And you're like, mm -hmm. I'm doing the best I can. If, if, if you're not comfortable in that way, it's, it's, it's really hard. Because yeah. because because your email your email is filled more with the waving fist <laughs> than he's the, waving than... his fist, guests. He's waving. His <laughs> fist. It's more of that than than bouquets of flowers. I'll try to paint a picture. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I have to say, Jonathan, that um, I'm going to recommend to Joe that we do a part two because I don't know Cole how you feel, but I don't think we've even scratched the surface of some of the things that we wanted to bring to light. Um, we are going to start wrapping it up here shortly, but I wanted to ask a couple of questions that you can combine if you'd like before we close. Um, and the first one is, is there anything that we miss that you want to make sure that our audience hears about you, about your work, or about something happening at Montclair that is especially fabulous? And then what do you think is the future of higher education? So the one thing I want to the one thing I want to mention uh, is that it's it's related to the the idea of serving uh, serving communities. But I'm a big believer in uh, promoting public service. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's something that I sort of have embraced as, as part of my part of my assignment uh, uh, for for many many years. And uh, I think that I think that we have we have in uh, the younger generation actually a strong public spiritedness. Uh, yeah. I think that there's an uh, uh, incorrect uh, view that young people are disinterested and they only want to be on Instagram and stuff like that. I think that's not I true. I think they're turned off to politics. That's yes. an issue. We have to address that. But they're not turned off to service. And yeah. so universities need to capture that energy, create opportunities for service, and advance that. And uh, I'm very excited about an initiative I I helped uh, launch at, at ASU, the Next Generation Service Corps, which then working with the Volcker Alliance is spread nationally. Uh, we embrace public service at Montclair. We think of ourselves as the public service university of our state. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's something that all of us need to be focused on. Uh, I think it's important uh, to create this civic spirit. And I also think it's a crucial element if we're gonna heal the politics of our country, which are all about division because service yeah. is about cohesion. And so, yeah. and so we need to get there. Uh, the other thing, the other thing I'd throw out there is uh, as much as I'm a defender of education, a uh, higher education, uh, the future uh, is going to be about change um, mm -hmm. and meeting the needs of our students and, and not being dedicated to doing what we do because it's what we know, but actually adapting to what students need in order to thrive. And, and I think that means a lot of different things. Uh, one thing that it means is mixing and matching face-to-face -face and online and synchronous and asynchronous. Um, the idea that there's online and there's traditional, mm -hmm. like that's that's so 2023. Like that's not gonna, <laughs> that's, not, that's not gonna work. That's not gonna work. And so we are gonna it's have not. to figure out, we're gonna have to figure out how to, um, how to alter that. I'm excited about our steps towards that. We call it Montclair Unbound. Um, but nice. that's the bit that's the beginning. Uh that's the beginning, uh, that's the beginning of an evolution, not not an end point. Cole, is there anything that you wanted to make sure that we close with about your friend Jonathan? Anything you want to highlight about his work or a final question? Nothing I could uh add to what we've already, I think, discussed. I'm grateful, Jonathan, for your involvement and 
participation and bringing all of these uh, ideas and perspectives uh, to the forum and also to to this forum. Um, so thank you. Thank you. And, yeah. and I'll say I'll say one 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 part of the future that um, that Cole's work underscores is uh, success is going to be about collaboration. Mm -hmm. um, people think of universities competing in part because they see them on, you know, football fields, um, but also because we think of everything as zero sum. Uh, the, the success in higher education, if there is success in higher education, is going to be about collaboration among multiple institutions, mm -hmm. uh, because that's going to be how we better serve students. I'm convinced of it. And so we're going to need to figure out how to develop those muscles, right? Like, how do we do that? Um, because... Because if we don't, um, people won't differentiate between the good guys and the bad guys. They'll just say you're all, you're all bums. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and so, so that's 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 important. And uh, and so the the kinds of conversations that we're having, the the personal relationships that are being built among individual yes. leaders, is as important as the institutional collaborations. And so it's exciting to see that see that happen. And you're really good at that, uh, Jonathan. I encourage. Uh, our listeners to check you out on LinkedIn. I especially appreciate, I want to make sure I, I, I touched on this before we close, but I appreciate that you called out the president of University of Houston. Renu, you're good at calling out your colleagues and highlighting the challenges that they're facing and also celebrating the good things that they're doing. It takes that type of relationship building, right? To, to lower the anxiety around competition, right? Um, it's about helping students ultimately and helping the country uh, to benefit from the strengths of students. And so I think that's something that you do well that is one of those soft skills that we need future leaders to have. So it has been such an honor to interview you, to learn from you uh, today. I know that our audience is, is getting a kick out of um, note-taking and uh, saving this episode for future reference. Uh, I hope that we can have you back. I also hope that you'll come uh, uh, onto the EdUp Emergence podcast and be a guest host with me because I think that you would uh, do great in conversation with those emergent leaders. So folks, it has been uh, a really great episode today. I'm very proud of it. We have been interviewing uh, Dr. Jonathan Coppell, the president of Montclair University. And my guest uh, co-host was Cole Clark with Deloitte on the higher ed division. And uh, Cole, it was nice to meet you. Nice to work with you. Folks, make sure that you follow uh, EdUp Experience podcast. Make sure you share the great episodes with your friends and neighbors. Uh, reach out if you know someone that would be a great guest on the, on the show. And look out in the future for EdUp Emergence that's coming soon on the topic of interviewing the future community college and university presidents of our great country. Um, you have just EdUp. Attention. It's Time to register for Elucian Live 2024, April 7th through 10th in San Antonio, Texas. Illuminate, innovate, inspire, explore higher education's greatest opportunities with future ready ideas, solutions, and best practices designed to drive transformation. Register now at elive.elucian.com. This conference is going to be epic. Hey there, higher ed leaders. Are you thinking about joining the EdUp Experience podcast at Insights EDU on February 20th through 22nd in Phoenix, Arizona? 100%. I thought so. This is the go-to event for higher education marketing and enrollment management. At Insights EDU, you'll gain cutting-edge insights from industry experts, including speakers from companies like Google, LinkedIn, Adobe, Salesforce, and more. Become the transformational leader your campus needs by participating in discussions on important topics like online student demands and preferences, increasing affordability and accessibility, branding, measuring marketing performance, and much more. Insights EDU is the conference you need to attend in 2024. Register now at insightsedu.com and use the code EDUP to save $50 off your registration.